Welcome everyone. So this is our ladies room. So we are very uh, happy to have you all here. So as you seen, we are 75 people already. Hello, Cedric. How are you doing? I'm fine. All good. How are you? Good to see you all. Welcome. Absolutely great. Uh, so very excited to have to this to this talk, as you know, that um, uh, I, I love that visualization, and so what better than have you here with us? Great. So let's get started. Uh, I start introducing uh, our chapter, and then I leave the floor uh, to Cedric without uh, spending any uh, much time. Okay. Let's share my screen can you all see my screen yeah okay so Welcome to Our Ladies Room, even more exciting data visualization with ggplot2 extension. Speaker, Cedric Serer. Uh, I pronounced it right. <laughs> okay. So, um, before, uh, before all, so i like to remind you that this talk is recorded and will be posted on YouTube. You can uh, watch it again uh, on youtube.com at our ladies uh, room. And please remember that all our attendees are expected to adhere to our code of conduct. You can have um, a look at the um, COC code of conduct. And we do this because we, uh, we like to create a safe environment, an inclusive space, uh, free from any form of harassment, fostering a, a respectful environment for everyone to learn and connect. But feel free to use the chat, raise your hand for asking questions, most, most probably at the end of the, uh, the presentation. The material for today, so this is, uh, this is going to be a watch and learn session. Uh, all material will be shared during the presentation, then you can have a look and um, so uh, um, look at all the, the code that will be shared. But in case you want to, you'd like to do and learn, uh, you need um, our studio. Uh, and so you might want to download your our studio if you don't have um, already. Uh, on your computer, or you might want to use Posit Cloud, which allows you to use RStudio without any uh, installation. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the first data visualization event uh, of November. This month uh, is um, all the special significance for exploratory data analysis. And we are fortunate to host one of, but, uh, two fabulous events featuring expert uh, data visualization professionals, Cedric Serer, our speaker for this session, and Cara Thompson. Uh, she will join us on November the 30th. So we are honored to welcome Cedric, a mentor, a tremendous inspiration. Cedric is a, a field expert and founder of the 30 Day Chart Challenge providing an excellent opportunity for practice and networking within the data visualization community. As you can uh, already see, all is uh, uh, amazing produ production. So I'll be sharing a bit more about our chapter and activities before handing over the floor to our speaker. Who are we? So my name is Federica Gazzelloni and I am the lead organizer for our latest Rome events. Uh, we organize talks, workshops, tutorials, uh, generally sponsored by the R Consortium and the Linux Foundation, all with the mission of promoting the R language within the data science community. We are a diversity-friendly community 
And personally, as a statistician and actually, I'm passionate about data visualization. So I actively participate in competitions such as uh, Tidy Tuesday, a 30 day chart challenge, and the ongoing 30 day map challenge, which is uh, a challenge. <laughs> so the other organizers are Katie, uh, Katie Wood and Francesca Picone. Uh, uh, they are both um, experienced. Uh, marketing manager and statistician actually, so professional uh, in, um, uh, in, the, in the field of risk management. What is Our Ladies in general? Our Ladies is a global organization with the mission of promoting the art language for the empowering women at all user levels by building a collaborative global network. It is a gender diversity blended community which uh, was founded in 2012 by Gabriela de Chiaroz in San Francisco. And it is now a worldwide organization with 219 chapters about, because they are um, founding new chapter every day, um, in uh, uh, about 63 countries and 3,900. 943 events and more than 93,000 members globally. So it's a growing community. You can uh, visit artladies.org to, to have a look at the website and have more information. So Art Ladies Rome, uh, it's part of Art Ladies Global and as well as dedicated uh, to promote gender diversity. Uh, we do monthly meetings, um, almost uh, every month, sometimes even twice a month, uh, and provide a platform to discuss current trends and hot topics in R, but not only that. So we do talks about careers and many things. So we encourage active participation and engagement for all attendees. So we welcome suggestions, comments, and invite you to get in touch, and join our vibrant community. You can get uh, in touch here, uh, I'm sending an email or through all the um, many uh, uh, social networks that we got. So uh, you can write us at rome at ourladies.org. Um, what we did it so far, this is the first year of our ladies Rome, has been um, very uh, intense and, uh, with a diverse array of events. We had talks and on workshops, coding sessions, engaging panel discussions. So the gathering have uh, all shared a common theme, our passion for our programming language, data science and statistics. So we also had machine learning, infectious disease modeling. And so we expect much more next year. Uh, our next event, as I mentioned uh, at the very beginning of this uh, presentation, uh, will be on the 30th of November with Cara Thompson, continuing with the Data Visualization Month. Uh, she will lead us through 10 tips for better text, uh, typography, met ggplot and friends, so in December. And we will be partnering with Our Ladies Paris for um, the next, the following months. But uh, more information coming soon. Finally, uh, your support and involvement are crucial to our success. So you can um, support Our Ladies Rome on opencollective.com slash Our Ladies Rome. Uh, we are an open collective, uh, open source uh, uh, community um, uh, supported by the Art Consortium and our members. Finally, today's presentation, Dr. Cedric Serrer. So he is a data visualization designer, consultant, and educator with a background in ecology. He blends analytical expertise with design passion, applying skills to diverse disciplines. Known for his study Tuesday contributions, Cedric's mission revolves around merging data analysis and design principles to deliver effective and vis visually appealing visualizations. 
So without further ado, I'm thrilled to hand over the virtual stage to Cedric Serrer. His expertise and insight promise to make this data visualization event an exciting experience for all. Let's dive in. Thank you very much, Federica, for the nice introduction and great to be here. I'm also going to share the right window here, if I can. Here we go. So yeah, it seems to be a good week for our ladies and data viz. Um, whoever hasn't checked out Tanya's talk, who's already also here today, uh, was a great session. So I'm going to continue going back to ggplot2, but I also will have some interactive and CC CSS stuff here. So um, yeah, I'm excited to give this talk um, again. I was giving this um, a few weeks ago here in Berlin in person. So I'm excited to now have a platform to kind of like also make it available for people all over the world. As we have seen from the chat, uh, wonderful, really like, I saw a lot of different countries in there. I'm very happy to welcome you. Um, I don't need to kind of say much more about me. Federica said a lot of welcoming words here. So I'm, I'm a freelance um, database person expert, specialist, designer, instructor, whatever. I'm um, mostly doing consulting. Um, so working together with clients, working on data workflows and data visualization, still mostly with R and ggplot, doing a lot of coaching on general principles of data visualization and working with ggplot and all of this, yes, with R Studio and all these nice packages we see here on the laptop. So some of my uh, previous works here co um, collected, um, these are um, some works for clients, working with Scientific American, um, the USGS, the German Institute for Population Research and some others. And Federica also mentioned several challenges here and I feel kind of bad because I'm not that active anymore currently because of um, yeah, other duties, private and um, personal stuff. But here's some of my contributions. So this is basically how it started. So I was, um, um, studying and doing my PhD in ecology and finding out about ggplot2 and what fell in love and after my thesis I went into all of the challenges first of all Tidy Tuesday but then also the 30-day challenges and so on and if I'm allowed to kind of like work on these personal projects I'm often coming up with more colorful more uncommon um, charts. So short blog here for my web page um, it's, it's a blogs um, type web page where I Unregularly share some insights on data viz and ggplot codes. I want to just want to highlight uh, two things here. One is the ggplot tutorial most of you likely know already. Um, it features now around like, I don't know, 200 examples of how to adjust and modify ggplots. And um, still one of the highlights from last year, I was um, um, yeah, honored to give a workshop um, at the, our studio conf in Washington, DC, which is um, all available for free. Um, open access available. So it's a two day workshop for basic and advanced stuff. Um, you will find like the slides, codes, exercises, and so on. And um, also the workshop from this year from PositConf. Um, they are online, but I haven't shared them yet publicly that or widely. They are already available. And lots of codes can be found on my GitHub as well, mostly for my personal projects and, uh, and the challenges. So if you feel like uh, we want to have a look how these charts are created, um, feel free to check out my GitHub. So Federica was so nice to already share the um, contents for today. So there are the slides. If I can find my chat, I will resend it again. Um, the slides are available as well as the script. If you want, want to follow along, I suggest to do this afterwards because um, I'm going to these examples rather quickly to uh, give you more insight on the packages and not really like the details of the, of the code. So you can explore them later with the script. And I'm using um, a custom typeface as always, so you will find the font files on Google Fonts. Okay, short introduction on ggplot. I think all of you know this wonderful library. Um, this is just the, the description text of the package itself, which is very technical, saying that it's a system for declaratively creating graphics based on the grammar of graphics. So it's about the layers we can combine to create all kinds of exciting visualizations and maybe also unusual ones. And this is what I'm mostly going to talk about, about new layers which are provided by other packages, which are part of the ggplot universe. A general ggplot or basic one always needs three things. It's the data. Um, so the data set we want to visualize initialize, initialize with the ggplot call, then a mapping of my of our variables to certain aesthetics. 
and then a geometrical or um, layer or a statistical layer to create the geometry. Um, in an advanced or more polished um, plot, if you want to fine tune this and modify it, you might want to use um, statistical transformations, facets to um, create small multiples, play around with coordinate system settings, um, use scales to adjust the um, aesthetic mappings, and maybe also um, modify the theme. So I'm still using these wonderful drawings by Alison Horst. Kudos to that um, again because they are kind of featured in all of my sessions. Um, so Alison Horst here nicely showed that ggplot is a great tool for visual data exploration. And these flying charts may look familiar to you. These are more basic charts. We see the, the default color um, palettes here. And these are just some, some examples from the ggplot webpage. So these should kind of look familiar to you. But as Alison also um, kind of created this one where it's about building a data masterpiece with DigiBot 2. And we already can see like um, certain boxes here in certain charts that there are custom colors, maybe un unusual geoms, which are not coming with DigiBot itself, uh, maybe even animated or interactive charts and so on. So here I have a collection. There are tons of great examples, especially thanks to Tidy Tuesday and all the contributors. So here's some, some variety of charts, maps, uh, different graphics, even generative art and some pixel art by um, several people, uh, including Thomas Lynn Patterson, Georges Carmanis, Tanya Shapiro, Jake Kaup, Jake Davison, and some of mine. And these are created often with the help of some extension packages. So what's, what, is, what is an extension package? GGBot 2 provides a lot of um, layers and additional functionality, but there are several packages where people thought like, well, this would be cool to have this certain chart type or this functionality to be added to ggplot. So this is basically the whole root of ggplot extensions. There is, and it's linked here, the gallery of ggplot extensions hosted by the Tidyverse people. These are 128 currently registered extension packages, um, nicely sorted here by likes or whatever you decide on. And there are even more. This is a, um, a curated list where people can contribute to. So that means not all of the extension packages are listed here. Another great resource um, to learn about material on ggplot2 and extension packages is the awesome ggplot2 um, GitHub page. Here I'm just a short recording or longer recording on how long this list um, is of extension packages and then it even continues with blog posts, workshops, materials, and so on. So feel free to also explore that one. I had to focus on a few packages, um, so let's jump into it. And if you wanna keep up to date or wanna be up to date um, with the latest um, developments, um, I still recommend Tidy Tuesday because those people contributing to this challenge are often um, yeah, exploring new options and using this uh, opportunity to play around with new packages. So we are going to work with a data set which I'm now using for quite a while, I think since last summer, 2022. It's a bike sharing counts data, um, which is um, offered by the Transport for London Open Data API. Um, it covers two years, 2015 and 2016. I'm not going too much into detail, but that's the data sets we are, set we are going to use. Before we can obviously plot the data, we need to um, import it. So here I'm, I'm saving it in an object called bikes, which is then a data frame. I directly um, link the data from an URL. So this is hosted on my web page. So you can also source it from there. And then with the call types argument of the read underscore CSV function, I can specify the, the column, column and data types. So I make sure that factors are factors and so on. This is a short overview of the data. So if you want to play around with the data a bit more, you feel free to um, consolidate that list. Uh, we are working also with two data subsets here, quickly jumping into it um, and a bit of data wrangling. The first one is a simple one. Um, first, I load a dplyr package to, to wrangle the data. The first one will be just um, daily bike shares. Um, there's a day and a night period. So I sa save that in the bikes um, underscore day object. And then there's some monthly data where I use the Lubridet, um package to create nice, meaningful labels for my months. And then I summarize the values per month for the year 2016. And then more setup steps now related to our data visualization. I call the ggbot 2 package to um, have the general um, functionality available. And then what I always um, suggest to do, and usually you will find in all my scripts at the very top, 
is to kind of like update the default theme. So with the theme set function, you can set a new theme and I'm using the minimal theme here with uh, the ASAP semi-condensed um, family and a bit bigger label so you can read them properly. Afterwards, I modified three tiny things um, with the theme update function. So this then applies to all the plots that are created with ggplot afterwards. So um, the plot title will be aligned with the plot margin, the left plot margin. Um, I increase the plot title a bit further and I remove the, uh, the minor grid, which um, yeah, don't get me random about it, but um, I, I don't like it, so I always remove it. Okay, I try to kind of put these packages together in certain sections. So the first section would focus on visualizing distributions across categories. So if we would use ggplot alone for that, you maybe would come up with a, with a box plot here. Um, so we initialize the, the plot with ggplot and the data, and then we map the two variables, this categorical variable season to the x-axis and humidity, which is continuous to the y-axis. And we can then add one of the layers um, which are suitable for this kind of data. So this is for example, gm underscore box plot. This is a very specific chart type and there's nothing bad about box plots, but there's certain ways or other ways how we can visualize that or maybe even combine that. Some people like violin plots. So these are also provided, they're not, um, very well designed here. It's a simple violin plot. You still need to do the filling and stuff, but it's available with the GM violin already and ggplot2. And um, some people also like to combine those to have the both like the summary statistics of a box and whiskers plot and the general distribution with these kind of violin plots. The first and likely one, well, maybe the package I, I am interested in the most or like the, the most used for me is the ggdis package. I think it's wonderful. It was originally developed to um, visualize distribution um, from Bayesian analysis, but uh, we can also um, use it for all kinds of uh, raw data and showing distribution of categories. So similar to the GM violin, there is a stat underscore I function inside the ggdisc package. So this connotation, if you don't know about that, the colon colon is called a namespace. Um, so I don't have to load the package and for you it's obvious where this function is coming from. So ggdisc is an extension packages which provides so-called statistical layers. They are starting with stat underscore. And then the new one here coming from that package is the I plot. The I plot is a violent plot with um, some additional um, metrics or summaries inside. This is not a box plot. This is showing now the the mean, um, the 66% range of the data and the 95, if I'm, if I'm correct. Uh, if you don't like to have these uh, mirrored density curves, you can also use the half I function. And here you see the default width is 66 and 95. So 66% and 95% for the thick line and the thin line. So this is not replacing a box plot. And we had a, in the last meeting, we had a lot of discussion around if this is meaningful or not. As always with error bars and all kinds of these things, you need to be very explicit about what they are showing. Um, and you can also adjust these because, well, this is code, right? We have a default, but we can overwrite the default. So if we want to overwrite the width, for example, to make something similar to a box plot without the whiskers and the outlier, but the box itself to show the 50% inner population, we could go for a single width value of 0.5. Or here on the other side, I show you how you could um, just indicate the full range of the data because sometimes these density curves become very thin. So this is a way how you can uh, maybe highlight the full range. By setting zero and one, I'm using the small line of these error bars and the, and the thick line is just gone. You can further um, customize these um, GMs. Um, Matthew Case, who has developed the ggdisc package, put a lot of additional arguments in there. So for example, here, there's the adjust um, argument, which allows you to um, uh, modify the bandwidth. So you see it's now more, more curvy, the fitting of the data distribution. We can change the shape and the size of the, of the uh, mean point, but also like, of course, the filling and the colors and so on. So this is what I have used for um, the penguins visualization I did back then for Tidy Tuesday. In the lower part, you see this kind of like variant of a, of a rain cloud plot where we have a box plot, a stylized box plot. Is, um, I was trying to, to imitate the tableau box plots, which are look kind of like modern and fancy. And then a barcode plot showing the raw data and then the uh, GG half I, uh, the stat half I from the GG disk package, which is used to indicate the mean value, the distribution and the full range. 
I also have used it for this piece here where I compare the um, speed rates and the information rates of um, certain families of languages here. And you see there's also like um, now grouped. So we kind of um, map the color and filling to the different um, rates in that case. And then you see the mean points are also connected with the line. So this is an additional geom, but the overall um, plot was created with GGDIS as well. So how would you create or at least get started to um, do this? This is pretty simple and straightforward. As mentioned, you need um, an, another aesthetic here. We map the day night in, in our bikes data set to the fill variable. And then by default, we um, get two distributions for each of the seasons here. And we also get two points and to have not overlapping um, error bars here, I just set the width to zero, which means we move all of them. And um, the rest is just styling. Here I'm using the shape 21, which is a circle with a, with an inner fill and an outline color. So I don't have to also map day and night to color. And I can reuse the fill from the area also for the points. And then in the final step, I'm just defining because I don't like the default colors. I'm defining my uh, manual colors here and remove the title from the legend. If you have um, questions on particular topics here, or Federica, if you see some um, urgent questions, then um, feel free to also raise them now. I'm not looking at the chat, so I might continue talking and talking, but we also will have definitely time afterwards to discuss it. Yeah, the, because we saw that maybe the questions that were uh, good at the end of the, the presentation. But yes. in case, in okay. case you have any question, please put in the chat. Uh, so we raise the question to Cedric. Perfect. Okay. So lots of flexibility and um, the usual behavior of the layers um, is still contained. So also as a side note here, I'm just pick packages I like myself. I'm not really a fan of wrapper packages and um, there are lots of cool utility packages, but here, as mentioned, I focus on basically true ggplot extension packages where we can like add components to our plot. Another interesting one, which I'm using quite often is the multi um, interval bars or lines um, that are also part of the ggdisk package. Um, this is the default. The default shows three levels of the population. So the 50%, 80%, and 95%. A note here as a database expert, I have to note that, that the default colors is um, rather suboptimal because we want to have the darkest color on the white background for the most important information, which is likely the inner group, not the outer ones. If the story is to focus on the outliers or the, the more extremes, then this choice is very well. Um, here we can customize it. So again, there's a dot with argument in the state interval function as well, where I'm using this formula. Um, so one column four creates five different four different numbers, and then I multiply it by 0 0.25, which results in these four different levels of 25%, 5%, 50%, 75%, and 100%. And the line width, so this is a way to kind of like uh, make this a bit bolder, otherwise it may, may look a bit lost here. And then I'm using the inbuilt ggplot2 function scale color viridus with a D here because we have four categories for levels with uh, one of the custom viridus color sets. And you can combine that. Um, here I combine two ggdist um, layers. I use still the stat interval to indicate the range and I see that the points are overlapping here. This was not the case in an old version. Um, that's definitely something you can fix. Um, that was not intentional. And then I use the stat underscore dots function from the ggdisk package. Um, and uh, with an adjusted position, with the position notch, I move it a bit to the right. So it's not overlapping uh, with, the, with the interval here. And um, this gives you an insight on the number of observations. A side note here, we have more observations than points on this chart. So this is also aggregating. So it's scaling it. Uh, the general recommendation likely would be to use it for single um, observations because if one point represents five or 10 or 50 um, observations, then you, the histogram might be more suitable here. This is exactly what I have used for not my cup of coffee visualization. I've created um, to um, visualize ranges of an individual ratings of coffee beans and um, by country here. 
You could also obviously go back to the half iron combined with the stat interval, not going into detail here. Um, the logic follows the same as before. We remove the width and we adjust the position on the X axis. And this is what I have used in a quite old visualization challenged contribution from 2019 to the um, storytelling with data um, challenge on the topic of visualizing uncertainty, where this is showing the range of temperatures in Berlin measured um, across 18 years. Um, I have a couple yes. of questions in the, oops. Sure, let's, let's answer them. Okay. Um, uh, isn't uh, this uh, Viridis team uh, th that, uh, that was uh, Viridis? Uh, mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, th and this kid. Oh, okay, for, for this kid values. Mm -hmm. Then we have. Uh, uh, I also. Uh, I was also wondering from which palette the colors are taken. Uh, they are very nice, and so that the color. Yeah. <laughs> so the very this this one. So this one is one of the one of the featured um, color sets in the Viridis package. So if you if you look at the Viridis package, you will see that there's a range of of those we know the the default Viridis, the uh, green, yellow, purple one but also like red ones, plasma, inferno, rocket. And then the Mako one has this range of black to blue green colors here. Uh, the other two colors I have used for the groupings, um, where was it? These are just some of my favorite colors um, I have I've picked um, by hand. And then there is another great question. How would you combine multiple charts together as they don't look like stacking them next to each other or on top of each other like you would do using patchwork? Yeah, that's patchwork. Um, I'm not going to cover it today. It's in the appendix slides. So if you look at the slides, you will find also some, some slides on how to use patchwork to combine graphics, exactly. Perfect. So this was on the penguins, for example, they have used patchwork to have two charts, the upper one and the lower one, and then also have separated subtitles for each and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, GGDIS has, has quite some other um, functionalities. I'm not going to cover all of it because we also want to see some of the others, but these like gradual, gradual uh, ribbons here, you can also highlight specific parts of your half eyes or whatever GM, this is the usual behavior. And you can also see like some cumulative densities and so on. Uh, feel free to explore the page. There's um, lots of documentation on these. So next one, very similar use case um, is the GG Riches package. And someone last time asked if um, this is actually now something we don't need anymore because we could use the GG this package to create the same. And that's, at least for the basic which plot, which line plot, it's um, definitely also an approach you could you could um, use using the GGDisk package to create something similar. So what's a rich line plot? Um, it's these um, density curves that are overlapping so with a bit of spacing to avoid that kind of like all of this becomes um, a mess with lots of colors. Um, some people love them, some people hate them, not going into um, what's great about them, what's not so great about them, but the GG Riches package offers um, a way to do that. Now I flipped the categorical and continuous variables here to have the seasons on the Y axis. And then we can use the GM underscore density underscore riches function from the GG Riches package. And as before, you could also group that and customize it. So here I'm again using the day and night variable to kind of like split these um, seasonal distribution curves into two. And then I add a bit of transparency to um, yeah, indicate the overlap of these distributions. So this is not, it's a quite a okay plot. You can uh, further streamline this. So here I'm using um, the color argument to draw a white line, which looks a bit cleaner because it's basically invisible where there's no data. You could even remove the um, extended um, tails of it. And I'm using the scale argument to control the overlap. So you see that these densities now between seasons are less overlapping. So you can also further customize these things. And then again, I'm using the manual um, fill colors. So to bring an example here, um, it has been used um, for here for the Catalan elections, but also for the, for the American elections to showcase how, um, how much different parties um, 
are similar or differ in, in their votes here. And uh, usually this is kind of like an American example as well. And this should be the same here, like how um, polarized these um, parties became, moving more and more to one of the side of the spectrum. So this is one of the use cases for this. There's lots of other functionality, uh, for example, in other GMs, there's a GM density, which is gradient, which allows you to also map a color to the X axis. It's not giving you an additional information in that sense. Could be a visual cue if you have one which is all purple in that case and one which is all orange, but obviously um, also the, the position on the x-axis already indicates that. But you could also add a median um, indicator line, or you could color the tails based on some um, statistical um, percentage of the distributions. And here I'm now using a custom gradient um, to create this color. The next section would be um, visualizing X and Y relationships. So usually scatter plots, uh, there are common problems with scatter plots. If you have a bit of more data, but already here, um, you end up with lots of overplotting often with scatter plots, especially if you have like a huge data set. And then you run into the problem that you can either have a, have a transparency, which works well to make all the points visible, but you still have a black um, above like um, all of them in one place and you can't really see the density of points or you end up with very light points and then you hardly can see individual ones. So there are some approaches to handle this. Um, one of the packages um, I want to showcase here is the ggpoint density package. And the ggpoint density package um, works with the idea that um, we color the points based on the number of neighbors, which means um, the more points are in a given area, the darker the color. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention it, the packages are also linked here in the footer. So if you directly want to jump to the documentation, you can use these links. So the same um, scatter plot now with the GG point density package and it's GM underscore point density uh, layer. And here you see by default, okay, I said the darker color, now by default it's the lighter color. Again, if we want to focus on those points which um, have a lot of neighbors, then we want to flip these color um, palette. And you see that um, the neighbors uh, ranges somehow between one and 30 maybe or 25 and the color indicates this. It's still drawing individual points. So this is basically a compromise of a true scatter plot and some binning. So you could also create a, a tile binning or a hex binning here to count the points. But here we still have the, op the um, raw data in kind of um, X and Y position but an additional indicator of how many points there are. You can adjust the, um, the area, what's meant to be a neighbor. Um, this is a bit of guessing or fine tuning here. Now it's a just argument. So you see 0.5 gives us a bit of different range of neighbors. And then I use again, the gradient here to map the darkest color to the darkest point. And if you look closely, and that's why I have kind of have so small um, dots here, is that we still have individual points. So you get kind of like an effect of um, points of different colors overlapping each other. So it's not a really a smooth gradient. Each point is colored by a number of neighbors. And obviously this one, now you can't group by any further color um, aesthetic because this is now blocked for this variable. Um, a pretty fun package. I haven't used that much yet, um, just for the USGS map so far and a bit of um, playground um, tests. It's the GT plan package. I'm still exploring it. The idea is the same. We have um, overlapping points, but now for two different or more groups. And the problem is if you have multiple groups, then you end up with like these, um, yeah, it depends on which, um, in which order these points are plotted, right? If you have a lot of points, then maybe the orange points are on top or otherwise the purple points are on top and you can hardly see if there are some underlying um, plots of the other groups. And the ggplan package tries to approach that. It has quite some interesting syntax. There are e even three different ways how you can write the code. So I will showcase it here. It's a direct um, stolen mostly from the vignettes. So feel free to read more about it. So the first one is this piping thing and um, we pipe the geom inside our ggplot code, we pipe it into the ggplan package in the blend function. And then there's a multiplier option here, for example, which creates this plot where we basically mix the colors where there's overlap. You see that these points become very dark kind of, and it looks kind of a bit um, wrong to us. Um, from a color theory, 
seems to be that the blending is perfect, but um, also again, Matthew K's package, he's discussing that and you can go further and um, combine multiple blends here to make fine fine tune this experience here. So I'm calling now the package because I need multiple functions from it. And then uh, we have this partition um, variable. And again, I'm not going to into detail of the te technical parts here, but we say basically um, the, the color should be partitioned by day and night, so our two groups. And then we now have a different syntax here, not piping, but these um, arithmetic operators. So we multiply a light and blend, and then we add this multiplier with a given alpha. Again, don't ask me on the details. Um, I'm still kind of like figuring out um, how really to make this accurate, but you see now the color looks more natural to us as a mixing of purple and uh, orange. You can even combine this with other GMs, then the code becomes even more complex. Um, now we have a list of two GMs. One is the first one as before, the GM points, which we blend all, um, in the first um, step. And then we add this, um, in this example, this vertical line indicating the mean of the humidity range. And this list now we pipe into another blend function with another setting, it's called heart.light. And then you see that we get a mixture of the line and the points which are actually below the line. So usually you won't see them. Still exploring options for this, uh, for a use case. If you have one, uh, feel free to share it with us or once you have done it to tag me in the post or whatever. Curious to see what people are doing with this fancy functionality. And the final one for this um, part of XY relationships is the GG density package. It's a simple package to create uh, density curves. And you might now wonder, well, we can draw density curves already with ggplot2. I think this has a bit of a nicer experience. I will also at the end of this um, package description uh, give you a point why the author thinks this is um, a better way to, to create densities. So from the ggdensity package, there's a gm underscore hdr underscore lines um, layer, which creates these um, different shades of different probabilities of the two groups. This is a bit messy here. So let's move on to another example where we um, can maybe see a nicer split of the two groups. It's actually using a KDE estimator to calculate these areas. And here we see we can uh, nicely separate these two groups and highlight the densities of the points. You can also change the methods. Um, there's, for example, these normalized um, multivariate, norm, multivariate normalized functions. I, I think you can also specify your own method. You can also fine tune the probabilities. So here I now have a vector of probabilities. Note that it needs to be in this scanning order. Otherwise, the legend breaks. I reported this today as an issue. Um, so here we have now 95, 75, 50%, 25%, and 10% ranges and it nicely creates these ellipses around your data. There's other HDR functions, for example, the HDR points geom, uh, where you can color the points. Um, it's kind of similar to, to the to the GG, um, to geom density. Um, no, not the geom density, the other one, <laughs> the point density package, the GG point density package. Um, um, but it basically colors the groups as categories. Um, for your given probabilities here, and with black being the, the inner group of the 10% and then purple being 50% and so on. And the use case or the, the motivation to create this package is that the, the GM density functions, there are multiple of them in GGBot2, they create nice looking um, yeah, density contours. But the legend, if you look at the legend, this is not really that meaningful. And also the how they estimate it, it's based on equal size steps. So the GMHDR, as mentioned, uses um, proper statistical methods to calculate these ranges. And um, thus also the shape is a bit different here. And also the legend becomes more meaningful. And on top it has these points and also there are some other HDR functions for lines and so on to create um, different chart types. Okay. The second last section will be working with text. Uh, so we um, update the theme to have the legend on the top just to have more space because I'm now shifting my setup to a column wise setup. Um, we have a bit of more code now in the, in the um, other examples here. I'm now using the monthly data set we have created in the very beginning here you now see the nice labels I created with the loop date package um, with the label option. And they are already ordered so it's not alphabetical. These are ordered um, ordered factors. 
And I create a simple line chart of the number of counts, so the, the bike shares per month in the year 2016 for these two periods. Nothing spectacular. We add a GM line with a certain line width and then um, again, the manual colors. And one of the my recent findings um, of ex exciting extension packages is the GM text path. And I think this is really wonderful because it saves so much work on labeling uh, line charts. And um, it's pretty straightforward. It says a GM text line and certain um, multiple other GMs are also there like GM text area and others, um, which we can add to draw both the line and the label at some point. So note that the GM line now is removed. So it draws both. And we then pass a label as usually in a GM text. But if you know ggplot a bit, then you know that if you would just pass a GM text here, it would draw 24 labels, 12 night labels, 12 day labels for each of the months. So this doesn't look nice. It was also overlap with your, with your line. So you would need to adjust it. If the lines are closer to each other, you end up with overlapping labels, all kind of stuff. So usually the approach is to generate either statistical transformation to um, just draw one of the labels or to create an, an, another data set you pass then. And this is all something you don't need to do with this great package here. With this functionality, it adds, this is the default setting, it adds um, the label in the middle of the line, um, so horizontally. And um, then it also vertically places it in the middle with these nice fancy gap of the line where the label is sitting. You can then further streamline this. So the line width argument is applies to the line as before, a bit thicker line. And then we can fine tune the fonts and the sizes and so on, the styling of the label itself. If you don't like this um, line break, for example, or you don't like the position and it depends a lot on the data, obviously, if we would draw the day label exactly at the May um, um, measurement, then we would end up with a very ugly label. So you can also fine tune that. Um, um, of course, we can remove the legend now because that's the good thing from a database perspective, right? We directly annotate our lines instead of having another legend, which lets people uh, flip around between the encoding and the actual data. So to showcase that this also kind of works, oh, I forgot to remove the text smoothing. I was working around with the text smoothing um, feature, but things got worse. So if you remove that, and I think in the script, it's not in there, I will update the slides accordingly. Then you have nicely formatted uh, labels here, not so much overlapping here, but I'm I'm passing the bikes monthly data set um, just to overwrite the labels to showcase a bit longer labels here. And you see it follows the curve based on the data points. And then I just pass that and I move the um, label a bit above the line so we don't have this line break. This is the vertical justification and the horizontal justification then um, defines if it's placed on the left, the middle, or the right. So I'm moving it to the very left with 0 0.5. So not at a very sharp end, but here to the left. And then yeah, the text moving you can use to fine tune how, how much um, the, the text is curved. As you see, sometimes it looks better, sometimes not. It looks a bit better if we make this a white um, figure here. And again, if you remove the text moving, this um, AM should look a lot better by default. The next one is ggforce. And the ggforce package is, is a magical package with all kinds of things, um, mostly GM layers and stat layers, but also facet stuff and all kinds of things. So it's a it's a nice box of tools. And I always love to go to the doc, through the documentation and have a look what's, what else is in there. And Georgios used it to draw penguins, actually. Um, Nothing you have to do, but if you if you enjoy that, um, that's definitely something fun. Um, I want to highlight something else. Uh, we are still in the working with text section, and I really love the uh, um, available functions to um, add annotations to your plot with ggforce. First, I'm going to store this um, simple scatter plot of a temperature uh, count versus temperature in an object called g to focus on the actual um, added functionality by ggforce and not repeat this code again and again. So I store this um, inside this G object and every time now I can extend that um, with other components. And here I'm using now the GM underscore mark underscore rect. There's a family of um, these markers in the ggforce package where we can pass a label and then also directly can filter our data. So basically um, decide on which group we want to highlight. So you could use it to, I have, have, have brought an example here. You could use case um, directly label your day and night groups here 
um, putting boxes around it. Here I used it to highlight these two outliers, which were due to network strikes in London in 2015. So I filter the count to be above 40,000, which gives me then um, only keeps those two points. You see it's also colored because these are day um, um, observations and the box is still colored in orange because we passed it as a global aesthetic in our G object. So again, we can fine tune this. Um, now I turn this into, I overwrite the, the um, color mapping by just setting it to black. So we have a nice box around it. I use my um, typeface here, which I use for the plots and I increase the label size. And then what's really exciting, so some people love this, um, this kind of annotation with the distance, with the gap between the box. Um, some others don't like it that much. You can fine tune all of this. Uh, I think it's quite some modern fancy annotation which comes out of the box. So usually it's the other way around. You have to fine tune it to make it fancy. Uh, if you don't like it, you can definitely um, modify it as you like. But I really, what I really love about it is the, is the option to add a description to it, which um, directly has this, form, this um, different formatting of bold versus non-bold and uh, different sizes. I even fine tune the sizes here with the label font size. Now I pass a vector. The first one is the, is the label and the second one is the description. And you can do this also for multiple groups. Here I'm showcasing this for one. You could also obviously have a list of descriptions and pass that as an aesthetic, I think. And then as mentioned, this is a family. So this was the rectangle. You could also turn it into a circle, uh, a note on, on where it's placing the, um, this, this annotation line and the label itself. There's no, not really a control of that. So um, depending on the plot size, you might end up with a nice looking label or not so nice looking label. It can't see the points, for example, right? It's a new, Layers, so it will sometimes maybe um, overplot your actual GMs which are underlying, for example. Um, yeah, with the circle, you see it's placing it somewhere else. Um, you can also have a hull. A hull here, it's a bit boring. It's it's still a rectangle, but it's well, and, but you see it's um, it's um, rotated. And the other one will always be um, aligned with the horizontal and vertical axis. Um, if you have more data points, then it draws kind of like polygons around your points. And then as mentioned, you can fine tune also like and remove the gap, not going into the details here. There are tons of more technical arguments where you can fine tune the length and the behavior and so on of these lines, gaps and so on. One of the examples I've used that for, for a client, um, sorry, it's in German, but it's not about the, the content here. Um, this was a survey. And instead of having a legend or writing it somewhere else on the top, we have these, um, these direct labels here to indicate the different colors which um, as you can see here, uh, modified GGForce GeoMark functions. And then finally, the GGText package, I uh, hope you know that already, um, it's a package to render text. So in the, in the basic GGPort2 package, you can um, format your text, you can turn it into bold or italic or bold and italic, but all, always for um, the whole element. So you can't really um, uh, modify single words or groups and I'm a trained biologist and Klaus who has um, developed this package. He's also working in biology. And there, for example, we want our species, Latin species names to be italic, but not all of them. So if you have a species, species name in a subtitle or a call out box or on the axis, you always had to turn all of the letters into italics, which is not the idea of turning your Latin species names into italics. This was the motivation and we can use a markdown syntax for that. Um, I guess you know that from R Markdown, which became very popular among R users now also in Quarto, you use Markdown. In your GitHub README, for example, um, maybe even WhatsApp came, came up with a strange alternative way how to specify it, but follows the same logic. Um, two symbols means bold, one symbol means italic, three symbols means bold and italic. Could be either these asterisks or these underscores, for example, depending on the setup. And you see now that um, I passed this in the GG title and it's not rendered. And uh, this is not working because we still have to specify to load the package and specify that it needs to be rendered. So here we need to address the theme um, element, the according one. So I'm addressing the block title and then I'm passing a new element um, instead of element text and now using the element underscore markdown, which is part of the GG text package. And now you see the title became bold. This is something I could also just pass as a general setting because all the titles bold now, but I don't have to. I can also do it this way. 
and you see period now is in italics. Not a species name here because yeah, bike data. Sorry for that. Um, you can also pass. Um, oh, there's a question first. Yes. Um, just a, a curiosity. Why would you choose to use uh, GG title uh, more than other simple title and then uh, GG text element markdown in the team function or uh, I don't know, like um, adding um, if, so if you want to move the text uh, on a different place, you can mm -hmm. have other option. But what is the difference in what what what? Why would you choose GG title instead of just using a lab function? Or oh um, yeah. So this is um, usually if I teach, then I also always suggest to use the labs function because I like to have all my labels in one place. Also, labs function gives you more control of also the subtitle and the tag, for example. And here in that case, I use the GG title because it's shorter in that sense. Um, you still can't see all of it. But for otherwise, I would go for labs title equals. So I usually have a labs function because I'm also overriding the access labels, for example. Um, in that particular example here, I'm not dealing with polishing all of the plots. So this is um, yeah just a workshop situation. So very rarely, I just use GG title. Um, but yeah, you're totally right. The labs function would work as well. I usually also su suggest that if you have more than one uh, one label which you want to customize. And if you want to move it inside the plot, I'm not going to show that, but there's also GMs which have the same logic. So uh, there's these elements for theme elements. If you have data related labels you want to place inside your panel, and there's also GMs which are featured um, by GG text. Yeah. Okay. And you can also use um, HTML, CSS specification of your text. So you can see, you can do a lot more. I copy pasted the same code um, down here because it became a bit longer. Um, if you're familiar with that, this is how our web page looks and un look under the hood. Um, Tanya showed it yes showcased it yesterday. Um, if you go on, on any web page and highlight something and hit the right mouse click or whatever F12 to inspect the element, then you see basically the same the same or similar things where we have like tags and here the, the opening arrowhead B closing one is basically bold. We also have EM or I for italics. And then we have the style argument where we can pass certain other features, not all of them which are working on a web page are working in ggpod as well with ggtext, but quite several. So I just showcased here that you can change the font size and the font family of single words. And you can obviously also change the color, which is very exciting. And a lot of people, especially in the tight Tuesday, world are using to remove legends and um, have this newsroom style of um, highlighting the different groups in the title or subtitle. Um, the element is still called element underscore markdown. Every time I teach this and talk about it, I say like, yeah, I actually would have liked to have a different name here, but this is what, what they decided on the, the package um, developers. So it's obviously not markdown anymore, but the same function, um, the same element is rendering also HTML, CSS specifications. Okay, and again, we can remove the legend now because the legend now is now a title. And as mentioned, I've used this for, for several um, client projects, but also Tidy Tuesday and other challenge contributions. So this is just one example where I highlight these both colors in the in the um, under uh, subtitle here to kind of like um, make sense of these two different uh, radial bar charts here. Um, I've used it to the geoms here to add these um, annotations on the uh, X-Men stream graphs I've created um, on how often the main characters um, are depicted and talking and so on in these comics. I also have used it to build this um, legend here on the left and the text. So this is also 100% ggplot, not necessarily something I recommend to do, but definitely something you do if you're participating in Tidy Tuesday because you want to make it 100% code. So this is basically another plot uh, where I have like different text boxes, but then also point size. So this is the actual value you see on the other side, um, lots of additional text labels. And these are also GG text um, GMs where I use different styling of the labels and different colors and so on. And also here you see bold text um, inside the descriptions. 
I also used it here for these um, friends visualization, this fun visualization of mentions of uh, different partners in the dialogues of the TV sitcom Friends. And here the, um, the access labels are colored according to the main character. And I'm not going into detail how you do this. Um, this is more like a data wrangling step, but if you want to do this in an efficient way, uh, you will find in the appendix an example how you, how you would uh, create such a graphic by not just typing each of the labels by hand, but combining them um, with mutate. Okay, and then as the last example from the GG text and uh, the text section here is uh, long handling long titles. Uh, here I now have a very long title and you may li likely know that, that GGBot at some point is just um, yeah, cutting your title or it's overfloating your, your actual area and there's no no line break or um, automatic line break included in GGBot 2. You can add manual line breaks, but then every time you change the width um, of your plot or the size of your font and so on, you have to basically do this again and again by hand. And luckily there's also an element underscore text box and an element underscore text box underscore simple element in GG text, which um, does this for you. It has some, some issues with you get very long, then you have at some point also overlapping stuff because you then need to adjust the margins, but in overall it works very well. And especially if you automate things where you don't know what's the, the title length, for example, you could write some functions to do that, some logic, like basically you count the numbers of letters, but if you don't have a monospaced font, you end up with um, yeah, different lengths. It's not only the number of letters and so on. So you can control that with this um, element. And you then can also style it as mentioned, you maybe wanna adjust the margin, the line height, and then you can even go further. It's a box now, so you can also add fill and outline colors and do all kinds of things. You can also use this for, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's the element. Yeah, I think you still have to have to um, have to fine tune it, but you can also use it for facets. For example, you find an example in my tutorial, um, the GBot tutorial, and also somewhere is a Stack Overflow question where Klaus was answering that. And then you can also obviously combine it with HTML um, or Markdown highlighting. So here I have colored and uh, italicized the day and night variables again. Okay. In the last part of the section, I think we're very well in time, it's a one hour talk, um, is interactive graphics. And as mentioned, um, yeah, this is a GGBot2 session. So usually it's all about statics and I'm not really going a deep dive into all kinds of interactive graphics because most frameworks use JavaScript under the hood and use some JavaScript libraries. And uh, if you now expect me to talk about Plotly because well, this is ggplot, I just have to pass it to Plotly. Sorry for that, I'm not a Plotly fan. Um, I, I, I like the simplicity and so on, but um, I actually always um, dislike that only certain elements were kept and there's a lot of things I could not control the way I can control it in GGPod2. Obviously the, you can also use a high charter, e-charts, grapher, all kinds of, if there's mapping, leaflet, R, tmap and so on, multiple frameworks. But if you want to code in ggplot and make use of all these tricks you have learned over the time, then you, um, wish for um, either observable plot, <laughs> kudos to Tenya, um, which follows also the grammar of graphics. But if you would truly want to write um, ggbot2 code, then um, yeah, there was kind of like a missing missing package, which is now filled by the ggiraf package or graph, ggraph. We discussed last time how to pronounce that. I think it's a joke on, on giraffes. Um, not going into the code into all detail. Um, it's one of the plots we have done before. It's the line plot of day and night counts. And um, I have highlighted here line three of the code where I pass the G, now oh, I need to get used to it because I usually say GGI rough, GGRAF um, GM, which is the common GM, you know, from GGPod2. There's also points and SF and so on. Here we're using the line, but you see that it has this um, suffix of interactive. And then we have a new aesthetics tooltip and data ID to highlight what's what's going to be um, shown on the on the tooltip and how it basically groups the data. But it's a common um, a GM, and I will um, showcase that it also works with other extensions in combination with the next example. And then um, I stored it in an object because we still it's a, still a static plot. If you would plot it, it would look totally the same as without the interactive part. And then I'm first setting the, the or updating the defaults of, of all the um, plots created with GGRAF here 
we have a toolbar and we have a zoom option. So it's the same things you can also do with Plotly. So often people respond like, yeah, well, Plotly comes with all these cool features. Well, eCharts, um, ggraph and all kind of other packages also have these functionalities of downloading your plot and stuff like that. And then we have to pass that into the ggraph function from the ggraph package. And you have to be explicit about the gg object here. This is something which took me you know, again and again, every time I go back to it, I forget about it because I'm often implicit matching my arguments. Uh, that's a good reminder that's sometimes a good idea to be explicit about it. So um, we pass this ggplot object with the interactive geom. Here I set the width and the height of my SVG so that it nicely fits my slides. And then we also can override some of the options uh, with these ggraph options uh, functions where we then can pass some, some arguments and also some CSS code here. So here I say basically when I hover on something and line 15, um, the stroke should be increased to a value of five and uh, inverse. So everything which is not hovered should become um, more transparent. And this is now a line graph in action, likely not a plot you usually want to use interactivity on, right? We can use the GM text path label for um, package to label these, for example. But to showcase a simple thing here, you can nicely now um, interact with these. Rather silly example. So let's move on to a bit more um, advanced example. Well, actually not from the code, but also showcasing that you, again, can combine it with other packages, and which is a nice thing which would not work in Plotly likely. So here I'm creating the same plot as before, or a similar plot with, with a GM mark hull to um, highlight the outliers and also a GG text rendered title. So these are now extension packages and I'm very, I, I haven't tried it, but I'm one, almost 100% sure that it will not work with Plotly. It will just drop or give you an error, um, I guess. Otherwise prove me wrong, please. Um, and I'm now using the GM point interactive instead of the GM line interactive. I'm passing as a tooltip and a data ID the date. And then again, I'm moving in this into the Jira function. And now I have a bit of other um, adjustments here. So again, the Hoover and Hoover inverse, it's a bit different here because it's a point now. So I also increase the stroke width and the size of the point. And then I also, you can also style the tooltip. So here I say, please, the box around my tooltip should use the fill color. So the color we have mapped. And uh, again, a bit of CSS to use the, the fonts I use in, in, in my visualizations to make it bold and so on and so on. So if you know a bit of the CSS HTML coding, you can really fine tune all of these kind of things. And yeah, this was something I was trying to do. So last time it worked. So you see that um, maybe I need to reload. I was three minutes before we started, I was trying to update this. Uh, let me see if it worked. No, didn't work. Okay, bad showcase here now, but I definitely made it work. Um, but there seems to be um, an issue from time to time with certain fonts maybe. Um, strange because last time in, for the Berlin session, which is just three weeks ago, so it was still working. Uh, nevertheless, you can use rendering here. Um, and yeah, promised with certain other setups, this might work here, but we can highlight uh, certain words. We also can use the gg force annotation here. And now these points are interactive. So if I want to look at the outliers, which exact date these are, then I can hoover over them. And because I have paired them by date, you always see the response, uh, the, the other um, measurement on the same day, which is for the, for the night data. And if I move around, you um, can basically explore pairs of data. OK. Yes? Yeah. Uh, in fact, um... I uh, experienced lots of difficulties on with this, uh, like changing in, uh, um, so adapting the output to um, uh, to uh, the desktop, or if you uh, are uh, on a full screen or, mm -hmm. or not, it shows differences. So. Okay. Yeah, even even with the presentations, for for example, not only with graphs. Huh? Okay, with graphs, you you might have other other issue until you uh, just mm -hmm. uh, save it as a uh, an image, uh, and so that that is frame it. But with presentations, sometimes when you do uh, like full screen, uh, 
you might expect things different. So changing mm -hmm. things. Uh, and I still didn't didn't quite catch why those things happen. Um, yeah, like, likely because it's a fixed size and if you change the resolution basically, then um, also with the Quarto, it's the same. Like if you're now looking on your mobile phone on at the screen and slides, then likely the, the footer is very huge. Usually you have uh, in the in the web dev process, you have kind of like basically evaluation of the, the size of the current screen and then you adjust the labels or the text sizes accordingly. Um, I'm not sure about GGRAPH if this is possible to have something like that. Uh, I honestly also never tried to use GGRAPH or look at this on a mobile, but it's good that you mentioned it, something I will definitely explore. So usually one solution to this is instead of fixing these values to pixels or point sizes for fonts, is working with something called EM or REM. Um, don't ask me what this means, but these are basically responsive units which um, rely on the size of the of the screen. But not sure if this fully works with uh, GGRAF in that context. And for Quarto, it's the same thing. You can have rules that on a certain screen um, the the sizes should should change. For example, um, I think that should be absolutely doable. And for web pages or um, Quarto web pages, I think that's also the case somewhere under the hood that it's adjusting the sizes. Yeah, and also uh, I have another question. Mm -hmm. When you uh, like render your plot uh, um, on a studio, for example, and mm. then uh, so you have like a legend and then you position the uh, text uh, and it when you visualize, it depends if you use an R script or an R Markdown or a Quarto five, so things changes a bit. But you visualize your plot; it seem, seems fine. But then you save it, and things yeah. might change. Yeah, that's a common issue. Um, there's no workshop or seminar when where not any um, someone is asking that question or like. And I think we all all in the room have been there basically. Um, at least I remember that moment very well. I was fine tuning my visualization for two hours or maybe even more, and then exporting it and everything looked messed up. Uh, so the usual recommendation is to use, um, yeah, for Quarto, unfortunately, this work for figure width and figure height. So if you use the the old R markdown chunk options, like with the sizings of um, inside the curly brackets with the figure width and figure height, and you have an inline output in your R markdown or Quarto, the plot should respect that. And if you use the same numbers, if it's seven and five, for example, and you use inch as the default, if you use the same numbers for your GG save command, then it should look exactly the same as in your R Studio. The other approach would be our camcorder package, which is another extension uh, utility, which was originally, so it saves a copy of your ggplot every time you run a ggplot. And the idea was to create an animation. But as a side effect, we thought about, hey, we save in PNG anyway every time we run the ggplot, so why not showing the safe PNG, which has a fixed DPI with height and so on. And we show that in the viewer pane instead of the plot pane. So the plot pane is responsive and doesn't relate at all to any gg save commands. But in that setup, you get what you, or you see what you get, basically. Or actually, the other way around, because we first save it, and then we display it. So this saves you leaving our studio, looking at your graph, going back to our studio, which I have done a hundred, a thousand times uh, for every every tidy Tuesday, actually. Yeah. But that's that's something annoying. Um, I've talked about this in both of the R Studio Conf and ggplot, uh, the Posit Conf. Uh, you will find some slides on how to work with aspect ratios. So it's in the latest Posit Conf ggplot workshop. It's in the in the first session where I um, discussed this, also how to make fonts work, if you want to learn more about that. Yeah. OK, so uh, I just unmuted uh, all the participants, because I, I like to allow them to, to ask you a question directly. If sure. They want, if sure. they want. Uh, it might be someone uh, with the microphone uh, on, <laughs> because like Janina, uh, we can hear you. So I don't know if I ask questions. But anyway, there is a question in the chat from Antonio Cassi. Yes. 
And it says bar plots showing means and error bars are considered to be misleading when comparing groups. Hi, exactly. information about data distribution, for instance. What is a better alternative to them, in your opinion? Thank you. Um, yeah, that's that's something we call dynamite plots or barba charts or barba graphs. There was an initiative. People were writing letters to editors of scientific journals to not accept publications with that. I wouldn't get that uh, that far, but I think it's um, definitely not the best representation, especially also for exploring the data that's bad because you directly summarize your data. So when it's the explorative part, it's definitely good to draw jitter strips or something similar, uh, bee swarm plots or whatever um, to visualize the raw data. If you have not thousands of observations, at some point this breaks, obviously. I have shown violent plots as an option. Um, or I, I mean, every summary plot is better than a bar chart with an error graph, uh, error bar, because basically a box plot is showing the same information, but you can zoom in. You don't have to include the zero baseline and you get even more details. Um, if you don't want to go as complicated as a box plot, I showed you several ones in the ggdisk, like the half eyes, the full eyes, um, dot plots, multi-interval strips. So I think there's a range of uh, things you can use for that. Yeah. And to finish this up, sorry, uh, wasn't, wasn't fully done, but I don't have to talk much more, but just to let the participants know, here I have featured all of kind of other, um, some of them which I've covered and some other packages sorted kind of what they do. So uh, feel free to explore them because I wanted to highlight also the other packages, but I could, as you see, talk for hours if I would need to cover all of them. Uh, also interactive charts, which are not all of them are, are GG. Too, but if you're now thinking about interactive stuff and you're not really convinced of GGRAF or Plotly, there are also other approaches to do that. So now I'm done and I'm open for any question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cedric. Uh, is there uh, anyone who would like to ask uh, a question to Cedric directly, maybe? Uh, if you'd like, just unmute yourself and ask him anything. Uh, and if you like, hello, Stephanie. Would, would you like to ask him uh, yourself? <laughs> unmute, just unmute yourself. Um, I was I was just wondering if among those that you just listed, um, if you had any favorite other packages, since you were saying some others, you're like, oh, you can oh, yeah, do that, they... yeah. Yeah, these are definitely my favorites I, I put on the list. Um, as mentioned, there's the official gallery and then and there's this long, awesome ggplot where you can go through. So my most used packages, I guess, are ggdisk, ggtext, um, and patchwork, I would say. Um, likely I forgot one now, ggforce also is one of the of the highly recommended ones. Um, but I also use sometimes very specific ones, right? Like a ggbswarm, which just creates bswarm plots, or ggsenke, which just creates senke charts. So they're also very, very tailored packages. Um, and then if it comes to color packages, I definitely also have my favorite ones. Um, so again, I'm a fan of packages which really work with the original idea of a grammar of graphics or a grammar of layered graphics of ggplot. So also these color uh, packages, usually most of them at least come with a scale option. And I think Psycho, for example, is a wonderful for sequential and diverging ones. Um, you know, maybe our Cartoon Color, which also has some nice, decent color sets. Um, yeah. But for geoms, I think most of them are listed here, uh, which really provide new geometries and statistical layers. Hi, I have a question. Yeah, hi, Ronald. Hi, uh, thank you. Really love your work uh, and talk. Thanks. Uh, just had a question about uh, AI tools and um, um, are you using uh, any specific tools? Do you know about specific tools that are more relevant for data visualization in R? Uh, and maybe you can elaborate about it a little bit. Um, obviously, I'm. I'm... So it was the question was about AI tools in our studio and R. Um, yeah. If I got it right, yeah. Um, I'm not really so. I'm very limited to asking questions to ChatGPT for now uh, when it comes to AI experiences. To be honest, I was looking into some. Um, so there's this. I don't even know what it's called, but likely someone can post it in the chat. 
there is, is something where you can basically use uh, ChatGPT and similar to create R code. I played around with it a bit about the ggplot, um, creating ggplots. Um, it might be a good starter, but you need to know a lot of details for that because it's mixing all kinds of approaches, sometimes not working stuff, sometimes outdated stuff. Uh, it was often a mess. Um, I heard about the new co-pilot feature in our studio. I'm not sure if it's already around, but if not, soon to come that our studio has a co-pilot feature, which I find a bit more exciting to kind of like have more complex requests, which seem to also seems to work way better even with R. Um, I know most people are using it for, at least from those I've spoken to using it for Python, we're very impressed, but um, from the demos, at least, I think it's also very promising to R, but I also haven't used Copilot to be honest yet. Um, I would think I'm faster than that, but likely I'm wrong. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Grillo? Uh, give away, uh, um, would you like to, to ask him yourself? Uh, hello, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, in the context of scientific publications, how would you like approach uh, quote unquote, uh, creative graphs. Would you agree that there are like, what would, you were talking about with the bar plot and the standard deviations? Like, mm -hmm. Do you think it's a good idea to get more creative to show that kind of uh, data in a <laughs> scientific paper? Or what would you say is the best option? Yeah, good question and certainly not something which I can back up with data. Um, as being a scientist myself, I think we have some, some choices which are just kind of like basically hard-coded and we always did it this, like this and then often answer is also like the audience is used to see it like this, even if we know the, the drawbacks of the certain visualization. Um, so I think it's always worth at least to explore other options. Um, so instead of just going for the one single graphic, in any context, I think um, it's nice to explore different options. Instead of just saying like, well, I know how to use bars. I've always used bars, so I use bars every time. Uh, just to see, um, so, so one thing is for the sake of variety when it comes to bars, um, bar plots are, and also I'm doing a lot of bar charts, which is totally fine. Um, the other thing is like really distributions, right? If I know I have a uniform distribution, there might be nothing wrong about a bar chart with an, an error bar. But if it's about paired measurements, for example, and there's a very nice paper um, from Tracy Weisgerber et al. from 2015 in PLOS Biology, um, which is called Beyond Bars. And I don't even know what's the second one, lines, I think. Um, where they showcase why you likely also want to visualize the distribution, at least for the explorative part. And then if it comes to communication, there's a strong debate about, is it good to confront people with unusual things or not? With one team saying like, well, we need to do this. Otherwise we can never establish new and better ways to showcase, uh, show our data. And others are arguing like, well, people are used to it. So why should we confuse them? Uh, it depends a bit on which of these ends you fall and your collaborators likely. I think the best idea is to really uh, try several approaches to visualize the data and then ask people, does it work, does, does it not work? So for example, box plots are wonderful summaries. Um, at the same time, I still think many people, even people who know how to read it and are aware of what they do and what they are meant for, they fall in the tra trap themselves by basically hiding some information, um, sample sizes, right, distributions, focus on the on the center group and so on. So saying all of this um, in context, yes, I think um, it's, it's a good idea. I think you should not become too uncommon. Um, if you become too uncommon, right, and really experimental, I think this is nothing which, which kind of like um, serves the paper very well. But if it's improving kind of like your story and the, um, underlining your findings, then it's definitely worth it. And I think also like in terms of, um, because I was also in the review, process certain times and where people were recommending wrong chart decisions to me, which obviously annoyed me a lot. Um, I think it's also, you can be bold um, to your supervisors, the editor and the reviewers and by saying like, well, see, this is this, these reasons why I use this chart approach. 
And then there's even scientific literature on um, like the Trisgerber one, but also many others, which you then can cite to say like, well, see, there's even a scientific publication supporting that B swarm plots, for example, work better than these other charts or whatever. So yeah, I'm definitely on the end of, yes, um, trust people they will figure out. And it's also your, you um, who is explaining these charts either by talking about them or writing about them. So I think we should also expose people to new approaches. Thank you very much. Uh, I really like your, your blog. I've been following you Thanks. for a long time now. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Great. So we have a, a Grillo. Um, would you like to mute yourself? Oh, I think this was Grillo, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, there is one more question uh, about can you um, use the HTML tags to change the color of the text in titles if you if your output is a, a PDF or would you have to pass the LaTeX code? Yes. Um, yeah. Hi, Josh. Um, you definitely can do that. Um, so the HTML code is not active in the sense. So in the plot, there's no HTML code anymore, at least in the static one. If you go on with ggraph, then you have HTML code and it seems it's not always properly translated. Um, but if you save your ggplot as usual, or you have it in a, it sounds as you have it in a Markdown Quarto setup, um, then it's rendered, which means um, just the final styling is safe, basically. So the HTML is used to render that. And then basically it's just pixels saving the italic bold um, colored text. So there's no HTML dependency anymore in your final plot. Okay, one last question um, yep. uh, from Sophia. Uh, if you have an analysis based on repeated measurements, what are some of the better ways to show this data as the samples are not independent? Yeah, this is also something which uh, is in the, in the Weisgerber pa um, paper actually, which is exactly what I always have used as, a, as an example, why you should actually look at these measurements, especially if you have paired measurements. Um, it's a slope chart, definitely. Um, if you ha don't have too many points, so it's a bit of a question, but even if you have many points, I've created slope charts with for all countries of the world. And then obviously it's a mess for some of them, but it depends again on your story. If you wanna highlight those few which are going down. So, so let's say you have 200 patients or whatever, and then only five of them are having a negative trend and you maybe wanna highlight them and showcase. Well, it's not many, but here they are. Um, and Tracy makes a good case in her paper why this is a useful thing because Depending on the slopes, you can directly get an idea if or you see outliers or different group behaviors. So it could be a mess, things going up and down and being stable. But it could be that all of them are going up and only a few are going down. And then you will maybe go on and further investigate what is the difference between those two groups, for example. Um, so slope charts and even so something or parallel sets comparing multiple measurements, um, yeah, parallel sets or slope graphs, I think. Dumbbell charts are also wonderful, which is basically a slope chart on a single single axis. Okay, so I think we uh, are, yeah. uh, so our time is up. Thank exactly. you very much, Cedric. So that was uh, amazing. Uh, and so uh, we look forward to, to more uh, of these events. Yeah, thanks for having me. And yeah, feel free to reach out if you have further questions we couldn't answer. And yeah, see you around somewhere on some, on any of these many social media platforms or wherever you're still hanging around. Have a nice evening. Thank you.